you and I have just met, right? Met online. I mean, you you approached me at, online and, and we didn't know each other. And we've just spent, what? I mean, 30 minutes <laughs> talking about trying, trying to figure out, I guess, how our, our, our different pathways you know, have led us to potentially uh, the same hymn book. But uh, so let, let me ask the first question, okay? I mean, I'm going to run this video within the context of a conference called Understanding the post screw Society. So the first curveball I will I will send you is, what do you think is post-truth? And is that a good term for this moment we're living in? I think it's an excellent, uh, it's an excellent term uh, because uh, I think right now we're living in, in a world where a fact is no longer a fact, if any fact is disputable, um, where truth is no longer truth, it's a political truth, you either are for that truth or against that truth. We're living actually not only in the age of post-truth, we're living in the age of affirmation over information. And that is the, the real uh, stimulus that has created this post-truth era. Post-truth is important, and uh, hopefully that era will be short-lived, although I, I have some uh, doubts about that as well, which we can discuss. Yeah, it's about this moment, isn't it? I mean, I, th I, think, I think when I was, I was thinking about this, and, and I, I, did, I recorded myself trying to figure out why, why this conference started to become a big thing, I think, for us here. I think that's, that's the thing which is worrying me, is this just the moment? Or, or are, we, are we meant to keep living this moment for, 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 for the next 10 years? And it's, it's something which is concerning me, because, I mean, I, I was very optimistic 15 years ago, okay, about the affordances of new media. And again, this is a side conversation which you and I were having right now. Uh, and, and and social media in particular, okay. I was I was very I was very enamored with the idea of horizontal networks, horizontal exchanges, um, a lack of intermediaries, um, being able to say what I wanted whenever I wanted, even within a journalism context. I guess um, the idea that I didn't have to write a letter to an editor for it to be published, I could start my own blog. You know, this, this, these were things which were very compelling to me, say, 12, 10 years ago. And yet now I've, I've found myself increasingly, when I teach, when I talk, being extremely critical about, about what we call social media. So when did you lose faith in social media and, and why did that happen? You know, this question comes up all, all the time when uh, I speak at conferences or when I deliver my papers. It's not that I have lost faith in social media. It is I have lost faith in people understanding social media. That's the big problem. Because if you don't understand the power that you have at your fingertips, then technological determinism will take over. It will determine how you respond. It will determine what you like, what you dislike. And at the bottom line of all this will be the financial uh, impetus for social media to foster that. In other words, it's not really free. Providing the contents, they are looking at that content, data mining that content to vent to other businesses and then to advertise to you personally, particularly now in, in the age of, of analytics. So I was always skeptical that people would not take the time to understand the power of technology that they had at their fingertips. Now that's very dangerous, Alex, because if you don't understand that power, then the machine will take over and then that machine will be programmed in a certain way as to actually affect your outlook on the world. Now this is when I started, these, these were my hypotheses when I started. And when I wrote Interpersonal Divide, the Search for Community or Technological Age, that was considered, as we discussed, a subversive book, subversive book. But what happened was slowly over time, everything that I said, what happened, happened. And now, when you take a look at the second edition, Interpersonal Divide in the Age of the Machine, everybody says, oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Well, the whole idea of this gradually becoming true is based on technological determinism, which uh, I think the best, uh, the best scholar on that was Jacques Ellul. He didn't talk about the internet, but he talked about the nature of technology in general. So if you understand technological determinism, you also understand that people who use technology 
have to understand it from a programming perspective in addition to a consumer perspective. What we have now are multitudes understanding it from a consumer perspective. You make that mistake, and that company will actually determine what you think. And this is the post-truth era summarized that we're living in. It's, it, I think, again, in, in, in terms of what I, I teach, I, I, I teach new media at university, but also the center that, that I'm running is, is, is trying to look at, at praxis as well. So I'm always thinking, what does one do about this? I mean, that, you know, when, when the Cambridge Analytica scandal happened, I mean, there are people like us, I guess, we shrugged our shoulders and said, of course it was going to happen. Of course, Facebook, you know, was <laughs> stealing your data or selling it or whatever it is. I, I feel the same way right now looking at Facebook and this Libra cryptocurrency. Oh, wow. Oh, please. Uh, which, uh, now they want information. Please. Yes. I mean, it's, 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 it's absolutely oh, no, Alex, Alex it's, you, you worked in the corporate world. It's all about the money. It's all about the revenue stream. And if people can understand that, from a computer perspective, they can understand. First of all, you know, we talked about Facebook. Now, you can talk about any of the social media, Twitter, or how many of the people who use it actually read the terms of service? This is, you know, the, the biggest lie in Malta, the biggest lie in the United States, it's the same lie. It's click agree that you've read the terms of service. No, no one has read the terms of service. So that when you read the terms of service, you start to understand the, the strategic plan of that company. So in my classes, what I, my tech and social change classes, I emphasize never ever click agree to anything until you've read the terms of service. Don't have the patience to read the terms of service. Don't use the application. Now that sounds like a very simple thing, right? Read the terms of service. The company writes the terms of service in such legalese language that it's very hard to understand. So. Well, first of all, our attention span is below eight seconds. Uh, now that is below the attention span of a, your average coach, all right? So if you're gonna write legalese in the terms of service, it's designed by corporate lawyers for you to just click agree and go on. And in doing so, you're giving up rights of privacy often, you're giving up content, and who owns that content? If you are a photographer, for instance, and you put your photos on Facebook, it, you don't really own them anymore. Facebook owns them until you log off of Facebook and then get all of your friends to log off of Facebook or delete what they have on their computers. So essentially, if you don't know the terms of service, you are actually just giving the company carte blanche to do with your content what it wants to do with your content. That is the biggest problem with social media. But this is only a small issue in the larger data uh, analytical world in which we have lost journalism. You know I'm a journalist, and that would be uh, important in our discussion. There are the, the five W's and H, you know, what, where, who, when, and, and how. And it, if you eliminate the why from the five W's and H, you can still make sales. Machines don't really need to know why you are making the sale. They really need to know what you want, when you want it, how you want it delivered, where it is to go, and, but they don't need to know why to make the sale. So in our age of data, data analytics, and you see it also in the news, we become a society in the post-truth era that doesn't understand why. We know how things happen, we know when they happen, we know what happened, we know where they happened, but we don't know why they happened. If you don't know why in the post-truth era, then politicians can give you the answer to why in a political sense through society so that we're all fighting with, with each other. And the interesting thing for me as a patriot, Maltese man, is I love Maltese. When I hear the word Malta, my heart flutters. When I think of the of Gozo and on Salem, the ancestral home of the Bajaya family, my heart tends to see 
what we have in Malta is the same thing that we have in the United States with politics breaks my heart. I wrote a piece about this in the Malta Independent. It's called Identity Malta. It, it, it ha, and, you, and as you read it, you think I'm talking about myself. But at the ending, you'll see that I'm talking to the Maltese people, that our heritage is one of the richest heritages in, in creation. And yet, we're fighting with each other. And why are we fighting with each other? Because it is in the interest of the machine that that happens. If we all don't have a political identity, strong feelings of right and wrong that are political in nature, not ethical in nature, you can sell things to people. So we ask ourselves in the post-truth era, why are we giving us the real truth? The answer to that, and you know this uh, from an economist perspective, is that the margins are too low in the middle. Ratify our media, we align them with political parties, we align them with psychographics and demographics that are data mined by our social media, and what's the net result? Fact, truth is no longer truth. We don't know why things happen, and then we're using machines that are determining how we should feel about each other and the world. So what happens? Democracy is the chief victim of this post-truth era. And journalism, which is supposed to enlighten the electorate so that they can make intelligent decisions in the voting booth, that is gone. It's gone in the United States. And from what I read, it's nearly gone, if not gone, in Malta. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think this whole contextualization, okay? And I mean, I'm, I'm pulling slightly away from journalism now and, and thinking more in terms of things which have become the norm, you know? I mean, the whole thing about trolls and not trolls and, 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 and from cyberbullying to fake news to all of this kind of stuff. And what, what I'm finding is how this type of vernacular has also been exported from a US-centric environment to, to it's almost like commonplace now. Um, and it's something which, which I, I, I'm finding deeply disturbing, but I, I'm also got to the stage, and I think it's the last last thing I, I I wanted to ask you about, which is about what do you do about it? Okay, now academics, people running think tanks, the most obvious thing to do is oh let's have a conference and get a group of people and talk about it. I'm I'm very nervous about echo chambers. I'm very nervous about everybody who who thinks like us. I'm also very conscious of the fact that, I mean, I'm seeing it from things like copyright laws in, in, this, in, in Europe, for instance, where you know, there were the best intentions as to what to do with copyright laws to facilitate open education or open education resources. And when push came to shove, the very powerful lobby groups still won in certain areas, okay? Um, and there are many gray areas, um, which, which I think need investigating. So, I mean, the question really is this, what can a conference do? Can it really start up something? Even if, is, is, there, is there use in getting people with usually divergent um, um, views? Uh, and the last question is, does everything still boil down to some sort of notion of journalism for the public good, which is the old McChesney view, right? Which to me, um, it was, was wonderful and it's still great, but in practice, from a practice point of view, what I'm seeing is the crisis of old media, trying to move up to the so-called value chain, trying to go increasingly online, having to compete with whatever it is because content, the value of content is now virtually zero, except in the hallowed, you know, sometimes our ivory towers of academia. So I'm, I'm specifically just throwing back that at you because I think this is where I, I, I I'm hoping that we find ways which go beyond people going, just going to a conference, having a good time, and then moving away and nothing happens. Yeah, let me, let me address that, because I think it, it is um, probably the most important question of, of this session. Um, conferences often, and particularly when they evolve around the central theme, 
such as post-truth era. They uh, frame what the discussion is going to be about. I think that people coming to this conference or those who read the paper that are written for this conference might have uh, some pushback just to the general topic that we're having. They still see technology as the democratizing element in the world. You know, I came up with the phrase, Alex, interpersonal divide. Interpersonal divide is an answer to Pippa Norris's digital divide. What I'm trying to say is if you embrace the digital uh, idea that it's going to democratize everyone, what you're going to be is a deduction or a withdrawal in the interpersonal relationships you have in real communities. The both are in, in they're, they're, they're things that I have written about for a long time. Let's get back to this conference. Okay, so people at this conference are going to listen to what I say, listen to this uh, interview, think about uh, my technological determinist attitude. Some will agree if they're honest, some will uh, disagree if I am undermining their uh, ideals. Uh, so let's do with the undermining I I ideals people in the first place. Okay, here's my message to those who want pushback to my message. Read the terms of service, okay? Okay, that, that's number one. Read the terms of service. Start understanding how technology works from a computer science perspective instead of a consumer perspective. If you come in to technology with ideals and don't understand that it's trying to sell you something, you are going to be victim to that machine. You're going to be split into groups, affinity groups, which will later turn into political groups. And so read the terms of service. Understand how application is programmed. You wanted me to use Zoom. I had never used Zoom before. I read the term of service. I practiced how to use it. I wanted to see what was going to be on my screen if I hit share. So I'm going to hit share right now, okay? And you'll see that I have my paper there. There's a whiteboard and there's you, okay? So there's, there's share. And now I have to find out how to how to click on it? There you are. How to click on it? There it is. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Now, now, now you're now you're seeing you you <laughs> that. All right. And now we are stuck in this in Zoom mode. <laughs> so I go I go over here and I hit you. <laughs> I hit you, and now we're stuck again. Okay. Yep. So, and somewhere, somewhere if you go down to the bottom, it might, you might say something. Now I'm on, I'm there. on check. <laughs> right here, right. <laughs> So, you know, technology, now it's determining how I use it. Correct. So what I want to do is I want to get out of chat. I want to go uh, somewhere here. So help me get out of here. In fact, no, in fact, I think, I actually think we could, we could actually. Uh, over I, here on the top is a stop share, right? That's right. There's a stop I'm share just, somewhere. I'm just, but I'm just pretending right now. The okay? interface. So now I hit stop share are. and you're and, there. And you've here's it. an example. Here's an example of using the technology and then having the technology determine what we do. Okay, so, all right, the people who want pushback. If you embrace the power of the technology, knowing its nature, you can be very effective. Mine is not an anti-technology message. It is a pro-computer science message. Understand the technology, embrace it, and you can be powerful. Your writing can be powerful. Your blog can have more people on it than the legacy media in Malta. All right? That can happen. All right? And that can invite its own challenges. On the other hand, for the people who might say, I'm worried about society. I'm worried about the political divisions that we have in Malta in the United States. I want my children to grow up loving their country having that same flutter that I do when I hear of Malta. You, you want to have that type of thing. Then what you have to do is teach them how to use the technology. So I'm going to get back to your question about the importance of this conference. The importance of this conference is to take away some of these, the philosophy of technology, but to do something that is vitally important. And that is to take back to the institution the idea that media and technology literacy has to be a required course. It can start as, as, as early as public school, 
but it must be taught. Now, here's why, Alex, and this is very important. Now, I don't know how teenagers, you have a 16-year-old boy, I have a 16-year-old boy. I don't know how teenagers in Malta use social media. But here is how I suspect they use it because the technology will determine what they do. When they have a Facebook uh, page or any type of social Instagram page, they are everybody. Anybody can get in touch with them. Then they are bullied or then they are trolled. And then they start looking at the controls on how to, to do this. Sometimes they're, they're able to do it. In some, so they learn about technology literacy by trial and error. By learning about technology literacy, by and what do they hear their teachers say? They hear, oh, technology is going to democratize everything. Technology is wonderful. Their teachers do not understand, most of them do not thoroughly understand that when you invite that power into the home, it divides the home. It changes the culture. It changes the cuisine. You know, I make the stitzy according to how my mother made it. I don't make it according to what I see on social media. You know, I roll the doll over and over again, a task that I hate. I don't go by Philo go. All right. The fact of it, and, and, and Facebook, when they see the word consistency, all of a sudden send me advertising for Philo go in Iowa, in Ames, Iowa, where I'm the only Maltese person and no one knows how to pronounce my name. Yeah. <laughs> all, I'm trying to, all I'm trying to tell you is tech. So take, if, if you like what I'm saying, if you hate what I'm saying, do this one thing. Don't think of yourself and your, your academic credentials. Don't think of the business that you want to, to, to start. Take this back. Go to your provost. Go to your rector. Go to your chair and say, media and technology literacy has to start in the schools. It can start in the early elementary school, but it must be taught in the university because we can no longer afford a society that learns by trial and error without reading terms of service. So yes, what could be done in the short term? Nothing. We are way past fixing this. The reason why is that Google, Alphabet, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook are now mega corporations that are dictating how we think, how we act. And so we can have that discussion, you can agree or you can disagree. But they're draining advertisement from journalism. So what we're, what we're having is social media determining what we're going to do in the voting booth. Okay, so what we, what we have, what we owe to society is to have an educational solution to this, not in the short term. There are no, there are no short term fixes. I can't change how people feel about the two major political parties in Malta or the two major political parties in the United States. I can't do that. Fact no longer has the same effect because it's been diluted by social media. But what we can do, and why I looked you up, using social media, using the internet, to see is there someone, is there at least a sane head in Malta that understands the power that we have invited into our homes? And I found you, okay? The, the, so, and I found your conference. The most important thing that I would like everybody to take back from this conference is go to your chair, go to your director, go to your dean, go to your provost, go to your rector, go to your chancellor and say, we cannot afford to have Generation Z learn about technology by trial and error. We want to maybe have a, a prerequisite for beginning computer science so they can understand programming. Now, let's go back to the, to the media. Now, the power of media is if you understand the technology, if you have a, a respect for fact, if you understand the truth that business might be trying to uh, obscure or that government might be trying to obscure, and you write cogently to the audience as a sincere voice, you can make an impact in how some of us feel. I'm not calling for investigations of this person or that person. I'm just saying that it's important to understand what the facts are. There are developments in Malta that are causing all sorts of problems right now. We need bloggers and media to say, well, who's getting the money? Who does this help? Who does this not help? 
Why is one political party for it? Why is not another political party against it? Could there be a common ground that we can all share? Now, that message is not going to be received because our political um, our political conscience is too is too trained by social media. But eventually, you will establish an audience of credibility. So your conference, not the fact that we need media and technology literacy. Number two, respect fact, respect truth, and above all, seek common ground. Stop dividing societies. That same flutter of pride that I have just when I see the word M-A-L-T-A, or most importantly, geo zeal because I'm a Gozotan, okay? That's the, import, that's the important thing. Wouldn't it be great just for one day, your conference can instill in everybody a pride of togetherness, a pride of community, a pride of understanding that we have at our fingertips something that's very powerful, and how can we use it? How can we use it to help make it come and pause? Um, no, but Michael, I, th I think a, a, there's a lot which which I heard which which resonated, and and as I as I, as we were talking before we started recording this, um, you and I had very different pathways to maybe arriving very, you know, in the same hymn book. I keep on saying um, the idea of not the idea, the need for what I call digital literacies. Some people call it whatever it is, or media literacies, they're conflated. I think the need to have generations, whether they're in the boardroom, whether they're in the home, whether they're in the class, to think mindfully about what is being served to them on a screen, whether it's yeah. this wide, this small, or one of these things. It's, it's an urgent need, and, 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 and that's maybe the advocacy side of whatever time I still have left. I mean, it's something which I believe very strongly. It's what, I, it's what I teach. It's not rocket science, as you said. It goes from read the terms and conditions of whatever you're signing up to. Yeah, I, I, mean, really. you know, I, think, I think what I'm frustrated with at the moment is the shrug of the shoulders. I sometimes get when we are in the stand-up comedy of teaching sometimes no and you're faced with like we all have students with these as shields and yet i'm not going to tell people to remove the shields my my objective is we're talking about attention disorders we're talking about you know the way i'm looking at it is how can i remain relevant to somebody who has much more interesting things to be distracted by because of because of these things and I know there are some very strong, strong opinions about this, you know, ban them or not, or not ban them. But I think these are some of these little, I think, side, side projects which could spill out of this thing. But I think the need for, if it's going to be a conference um, that, we, that we're looking at right now, because I keep on thinking that there is a need for like-minded people wherever they happen to be right now because of the, the crisis that we're in, whether we call it the crisis of politics, whether we call it the crisis of populism, whether it's the fact that, you know, <laughs> some of the most powerful people in, on the planet can start talking about alternative facts <laughs> and we just, we just shrug our shoulders or, you know, um, so I think we, 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 we've reached this crisis moment, but, you know, from my perspective, this has been hugely enjoyable speaking to you.